And as, uh, as you turn there, I also just wanted to pass along this information, give you this heads up in case you might be interested. Last fall, some of you remember we were in a series where we talked about the uh, churches mentioned in the opening part of Revelation. These are churches locate, that would have been located in what we now know as Western Turkey. And during that series, I ended up in different conversations with people that were interested in traveling to that part of the world and seeing some of these places. And so with that in mind, I've uh, scheduled a group trip to uh, Greece and Turkey next year. It'll be right after Easter, Easter of 2025, starting on, I think, April 22nd. It's about a 12-day trip. And uh, we'll start in Greece and visit places like Athens and Corinth. I think, yep, that's Corinth. And we'll kind of revisit parts of the travels of the Apostle Paul and different churches that he was a part of. Then we'll cross into Turkey and come along the western Turkey coast and visit some of the churches mentioned in Revelation like this. This is Laodicea and, of course, the largest archaeological site in Turkey, which is Ephesus. Now, if you'd like to know more about this trip or even just some of the history, because I'm going to be talking a little bit about that, I've got two informational meetings coming up. One is actually next Sunday during the 9 o'clock hour in the Corf Cafe, and then later in the month on Monday the 29th. So I just encourage you, if you'd like to know more about what these trips will entail, to join us at one of those informational meetings. If you can't make one of the meetings, just email me, and I'll be glad to pass along some information to you. Speaking of that trip, let me show you one more picture of a place where we'll be visiting. This is the theater in the city of Miletus. It's not that far from Ephesus. It would have been a port city during the first century, and this was a, a large theater complex. And by the way, I know some of you maybe are interested in gla gladiators, and I'm actually taking this picture on the floor of the arena where gladiatorial combat would have actually taken place. And I'm looking at what would have been what you might call the royal box as, as uh, marked out by those two pillars. Now, I didn't show you <laughs> this picture to talk about gladiators, but to talk about a particular scene from the New Testament. Because in Acts chapter 20, we read about a scene that occurred, I'm sure, within walking distance of this theater. This theater would have been surrounded by two harbors, and we read about Paul landing in this city of Miletus, and we read about a particular speech, and in the course of this speech recounted in Acts chapter 20, Paul quotes what is arguably one of the most provocative statements that Jesus ever made. Now, I realize Jesus made a lot of provocative statements, but if you were to rank them, I think the one that is recorded in Acts chapter 20 has to be high on that list. And the, the familiar statement, the familiar maxim that is quoted in Acts chapter 20 is this. It is more blessed to give than to receive. Now let me ask you, when you hear that statement, when you read it, what thoughts come to your mind? What questions, maybe what doubts come to mind? For the sake of transparency, I got to tell you, when I was a kid, this was one of my favorite verses. As we got close to my birthday, as we got close to Christmas, this is the passage that I love to quote to my parents. Remember, Dad? Remember what Jesus said. But I'm older now. So how, how am I to think about this statement? I mean, what thoughts come to your mind? I'm sure at some level you may be wondering, what was Jesus thinking? Is this really true? Can I take him seriously? And furthermore, if I take him seriously, exactly what does this look like? Now, as we wrestle with these questions, please remember this. The statement that Paul records for us is very similar to what we call the Beatitudes in the Sermon on the Mount, right? Recorded in Matthew and Luke's Gospels. Remember those statements? Jesus said, you know, blessed are the poor in spirit, blessed are the merciful. Blessed are those who mourn. These were all these provocative statements. And, and, and what Jesus was doing with those statements, I think, is this. 
as he was talking about God's rescue plan, this new reality that he was bringing about, God's kingdom, right? He called it the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven. As he was talking about that, the purpose of these provocative statements was this. What Jesus is doing is he's trying to reorient us to what life now looks in this kingdom. And when he talks about blessed, what he's talking about is flourishing. And in essence, Jesus says, look, I know you've grown up with certain values. You've grown up with a certain system that tells you how life is supposed to work. But now that I'm here, now that I'm bringing about this new reality of God's salvation and God's redemption, let me show you what true flourishing looks like. And with statement after statement, he's kind of reorienting us to life in God's kingdom. And that includes reorienting how we think about money and finance and the possessions and the stuff of our lives. So in a real sense, as we read this, I want you to hear it as an invitation It's an invitation to kind of look at your stuff, your money, your resources in the manner that Jesus looks at them. And in its invitation to what you might call the generous life. And so over the next few weeks, we're, we're going to explain this invitation. And as we do that, uh, we're going to look at what Jesus and the other biblical writers have to say about finances and money and how we handle our stuff. And in the course of this series, uh, one resource we'll make available is this. Uh, it's a very simple book by Art Rayner called The Money Challenge, 30 Days of Discovering God's Design for You and Your Money. It's really a kind of, I think, a very simple overview of how the Bible invites us to think about money and finance and includes a 30-day challenge along the way. And if you've never really thought about those kinds of issues or questions, I think this could be a helpful resource for you as we move through the series later on. We're actually going to have a Sunday morning elective that we'll offer to you based on this book and the accompanying workbook. Also, for those of us who are parents, if sometimes you're wondering, how do I talk to my kids about money? This could be a resource for you and in our family. Now that our three sons are uh, independent and on their own, I'm going to get a copy of them and look forward to some con uh, conversation that we could have as we talk about some of the themes in this book. So over the next six weeks, this is what we're going to be talking about and working through. Now, as I said a moment ago, when you read this statement of Jesus, it's more blessed to give than to receive. Let's be honest, we, we have some doubts, we have some questions, not quite sure what that looks like or, or what that means. And if we're honest, maybe we're familiar with the fact that, you know, you, you've changed the channel one evening and you heard some TV preacher talking about, if you just send me money, here's how God's going to bless you, and that's just kind of turned you off. Maybe the only time you've heard this uh, kind of statement from Jesus, it's been used in a very self-serving way. And trust me, I'm, I'm cognizant of that. I'm, I'm aware of that. But is that really what Jesus is saying, right? You know, if you give, then all this stuff's going to actually show up the next day. Is that what Jesus is getting at? Well, you probably wrestle again with, if that's not what he's getting at, what exactly is he saying? So we're just not quite sure if this statement could really be true. So this morning, I just want to take some time at a kind of a high level to unpack what I think Jesus is saying and show you how Paul understands it. So as we begin, let's look more closely at the context in which Paul actually quotes the saying of Jesus. As I said, it's found in Acts chapter 20. And as we come to this, let me, let me just explain the context. Here's the context. Paul is meeting in Miletus with leaders from the church in Ephesus. And understand, by this point, Paul has spent around three years working in Ephesus, investing in these people that he is now meeting with. But now, he's saying goodbye. Now, as you think about that, <laughs> remember this. 
some of you maybe have been in a situation where you've had to say goodbye to people, you've moved across the country or done something like that. Remember, when you have to say goodbye in a situation like this, you're probably not going to talk about the weather. <laughs> you're probably not going to talk about how your March Madness bracket blew up in the round of 16, right? You're, you're going to talk about things that are important. So notice what Paul talks about, and I, I want to highlight two things for you. Paul says this, as he's meeting with these people to whom he's now saying goodbye. He says, now I commit you to God and to the word of his grace, which can build you up and give you an inheritance among all those who are sanctified. And then he says this, I've not coveted anyone's silver or gold or clothing. You yourselves know that these hands of mine have supplied my own needs and the needs of my companions. And everything I did, I showed you by this kind of hard work, we must help the weak, remembering the words of the Lord Jesus himself, who said, and now we have that famous statement, it's more blessed to give than to receive. Now, as we look at the context of this saying, I want, I want you to see two themes. First of all, notice the theme of grace. <laughs> I mean, I, you know, I just think about Paul here in Miletus, and he's looking at these people, and he's like, man, I put, I, I've worked with you guys. We've had all these conversations for three years, but now I've got to say goodbye. And so he says, I'm committing you to the word of God's grace. I'm committing, committing you to the ongoing work of God's grace. And he's like, oh, and I have so, I have so much confidence of what God's grace is going to continue to do in your life, empowering you, equipping you, and how the word of God is going to spread out from Ephesus. And there's archaeological evidence that's exactly what happened. And so Paul is commending them to the grace of God. And then the second thing he does, he, said, he, he leaves them with his example, right? Look, I didn't covet other people's stuff. I wasn't in this for the money. Instead, you know how I lived. And what he is particularly reminding them of is, is the generosity at work in his own life. Now, here's what I want you to see. I want you to notice how Paul is bringing together the themes of grace and generosity. Do you see that? I'm committing you to God's grace. I'm committing you to God's grace. And as I commit you to God's grace, I'm reminding you of, of my example because this is how I anticipate, or this is one of the ways I anticipate God's grace being at work in your life to generate within you the same sense of generosity. As it turns out, this is not the only place where Paul brings these two themes together. We see these two themes brought together in what is arguably the longest discussion that the Apostle Paul has about giving in all of the letters that we have. And that is found in 2 Corinthians chapter 8. When you come to the Corinthian letters, Paul is dealing with, it, 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 these are two fascinating letters. He's dealing with a lot of stuff going on in the Corinthian church. He's answering their questions. He's encouraging them in different ways. And as he writes this church, we get to chapters 8 and 9 of 2 Corinthians. And he is talking particularly about a collection that he is taking for the church in Jerusalem. Now, as it turns out, and again, we've got good evidence for this, uh, the church in Jerusalem had financial stressors. Apparently, a lot of the people in that church were poor. There were other challenges. Furthermore, this is taking place in the 50s AD, and there were several famines that hit that region, and that only added to the stress and to the complexity of these people's lives. And so in response to that, as Paul is traveling, he is taking a collection for their brothers and sisters in Christ in Jerusalem. And that is the focus of these two chapters. He is, he's, right, he's challenging, he's reminding the Corinthians that this is what he's doing. He's inviting them to be a part of this giving, about this project. And this is how, this is how his conversation about this giving, this project, this is how it begins. This is the opening part of 2 Corinthians 8. Paul says this. And now, brothers and sisters, we want you to know about the grace that God has given to the Macedonian churches, right? There's that theme of grace again. 
In the midst of a very severe trial, their overflowing joy and their extreme poverty welled up in what? Rich generosity. For I testified that they gave as much as they were able and even beyond their ability. Entirely on their own, they urgently pleaded with us for the privilege of sharing in this service to the Lord's people. So notice how Paul begins. How does he start kind of reminding them of this fundraising project he's doing, how he's collecting for the brothers and sisters in Jerusalem? He says, let me, let me, tell, you, <laughs> let me tell you about the guys north of you in Macedonia, which would have been a less affluent area, and that those undoubtedly would have been less affluent churches than the church in Corinth. There is some indication that there were at least a handful of more affluent people in the Corinthian church. Paul says, let me tell you about Macedonia. Let me tell you what the churches have done up there. And he, and, but in telling them what the churches have done there, he says, look, I want you to understand God's grace has been at work. And it has produced generosity. Now, one of the interesting things as you read these two chapters, right, where Paul is raising money, where he's talking about this need in Jerusalem, one of the interesting things to me is he doesn't spend a tremendous amount of time, or he doesn't spend the bulk of his time talking about the people in Jerusalem. If I were writing this, I might have spent more time, you know, telling them, let me tell you how destitute they are. Let me tell you a few stories of what they are having to endure. Let me talk about how comfortable you've got it in Corinth, and let me show you what your brothers and sisters are going through. You're better off and you need to give. <laughs> but Paul doesn't do that. The truth is, he's not trying to guilt them into giving. I think Paul is looking for something more than simply, well, you know what? I feel sorry for them. I will give. Or I feel guilty because I've got more. I will give. The truth is, ultimately, <laughs> what he's looking for isn't simply giving. He's looking for generosity. And here's what I think Paul understands. I think Paul understands this. Guilt can produce giving. But only grace can produce generosity. And as Paul is encouraging them to give, what he is ultimately wanting them to do is this. He's ultimately wanting them to live in the reality of God's grace. And what is really fascinating, uh, what's fascinating about these two chapters is, even as he's talking about giving, or giving, you will find these chapters are just soaked with the theme of grace. Paul uses the term grace ten times in these two chapters. It is arguably his most concentrated discussion of grace in any of the letters that we have. And he's doing it in the context of encouraging people to give. Now, it can be hard to pick up on all of this in English because in different places the term grace is translated differently because as it turns out, Paul is using the concept of grace in different ways in these two chapters. Let me just show you this. Paul, in these two chapters, can, can talk about grace in terms of God's divine initiative, right? He looks at the Macedonians and says, you know what, this is really God's grace at work, God's ongoing work in our lives. And it's, it's these people coming to understand the gospel and the work of God. And the, so he can talk about grace in terms of, of divine initiative. Furthermore, he can talk about it in terms of the acts of giving. That is, as he talks, he talks about what the Macedonians have done and as he encourages the Corinthians to give, he says, this really, this, I'm, what I'm encouraging you to do are, are, are to embrace acts of grace. And then finally, he can talk about grace as just the expressions of thanksgiving that go back to God as all of this is happening. Now, why does Paul use grace 
in different ways throughout these two chapters? I think the answer is this. He uses grace in different ways because he wants us to see that there's a flow of God's grace. And what he's wanting from the Corinthians, it's not just, you know, I need to raise some money, so would you just throw some money in the pot? No, he's doing that. But underneath that is something much deeper. What he is saying is, what I want you to do, I want you to live in the flow of God's grace. And foundational to that flow is just the deepening understanding of God's work on our behalf, a deepening understanding of God's initiative, right? It begins with God's grace, and it's clear from Paul's writings and the rest of the New Testament, grace doesn't simply save us, it equips us, it empowers us, it transforms us. And as we live in the reality of God's grace, as we allow God's grace to kind of shape who we are, as we live in the reality of the gospel, it changes how we think about our stuff and our money. I think it produces a sense of wonder and worship. It liberates us from the grip that our stuff can have in our lives, from the, from the belief that the goal of life is simply accumulating more and more, and it, it causes us to see our lives as part of a bigger story. And it causes me to look outwardly. And that includes how I handle my time, my resources, my finances. As we become more deeply rooted in the gospel, it fosters generosity. In fact, I think it's pretty clear from these chapters. One of the marks that we are becoming more deeply rooted in the gospel one of those marks is just generosity towards others. Just a kind of an outward sense of living and an outward-looking attitude, and that includes how we handle our time and, and how we handle our money. If I'm rooted in the gospel, it will produce generosity, and if I'm, if not, if I'm not really a generous person, I'm probably not deeply rooted in the gospel. So what Paul is saying is, look, I want you to live in this flow of allowing God's initiative to take deeper root in your life. And, and as you do that, to allow God's grace not simply to work in you, but to work through you. And when that happens, it ultimately leads, leads to thanksgiving, going back to God. And that's what, that's what Paul ultimately anticipates in the life of of the church in Jerusalem. As you take this step, this is going, this is going to produce thanksgiving and, and this cycle is going to continue. And what's also clear, I think part of what Paul is saying is, look, this is the flow of grace and at different parts of your life and different seasons of your life, you may find yourself at different points in the flow. But this, this is the way of life I want you to experience. So why is it more blessed to give than to receive? Why should we take Jesus' statement seriously? Because the giving that Jesus describes is all about living in the flow of God's grace. I think about a scene in Acts chapter 4, the early church. Actually, it, it relates to the same church, right? This church that in Jerusalem that, that really just had limited resources. And yet in Luke 4, Luke is talking about how, you know, this church is stressed. There are all these financial stressors, but, but God is at work, and people who have are giving to those who don't. And, and Luke is just kind of describing this, and, and then he explains why it happens. And you know, you know his explanation? His explanation is this, Acts chapter 4, he says, this is happening because God's grace was powerfully at work in the life of this church. And what he's saying is, these people were living in the flow of God's grace. 
when I think about, when, when I look at that diagram, here's where my mind goes. There's like one particular life experience that I just always come back to. It was many years ago, actually. I was a young pastor just kind of starting out and leading a local church, and I found myself in the middle of India in the back of a taxi cab with a retired entrepreneur. And we were both in India as part of a missions project. And that morning, we had attended the opening of, of, a, of, a, of a brand new small campus for a Bible college in the heart of India. And part of the reason my friend was there was because he had been the lead donor in the construction of this project. So in, we're in the back of this taxi, and here's what's going through my mind. We had a long taxi ride. It was about an hour and a half. And I'm thinking, you know, I, I haven't gotten to know this guy really well, and I just got a lot of questions for him. He's got, he had a lot of experience in leading people and leading organizations and had been highly successful in that in a variety of ways. And so I just, I'm just going to start peppering him with questions. I got a captive audience here. What can I learn as a young pastor from this guy who's had all this experience working with people? So I just started asking him questions. And, and you know, in the course of our conversation, he answered my questions. But it was clear his mind was somewhere else. And so the bulk of our conversation ended up being a conversation about all that we had experienced that morning. We'd been at the dedication service of this small Bible college campus, and, and it, due to the nature of the service, it had, it had really drawn a lot of attention, not only in the village, but in kind of the surrounding community. So this place was just packed with people. All the campus was packed with people. And a lot, a lot of people who had nothing to do with the Bible college, they were there just out of curiosity. And my friend, as we're sitting in the back of that cab, he just starts talking about some of the people he saw. In fact, in, in, in points of the conversation, I still remember this. He said, did you see that person? And he would call, he would describe someone. Maybe it was like, it was like they were hanging out a window to try, they were kind of in this crowded building trying to listen to the opening ceremony, and he described all of that. And in the course of our conversation, we just ended up talking about, you know, some of the opportunities that were now in front of the leaders of this Bible college because they had made these amazing contacts with all the people in their community. And there, there was this new buzz of curiosity just about what's going on here and what's the message of these people. And it just felt like there was now this new open door for ministry and the gospel. And we talked about that. And finally, he looked at me. And he just smiled and he said this, and I still, you know, this is, this is just one of those things that just, just gets emblazoned in your memory. I still remember this. He just looked at me and goes, George, this has been one of the greatest days of my life. And he told me that. And I thought about it. I mean, here's a guy who at the time probably had, you know, he was 30, 35 years older than me, so much more life experience. And if you looked at his resume, he had accomplished so many things, so many impressive things in the corporate world. And, and he's telling me, George, this is, this is just one of the greatest days of my life. And when I look at that drawing, I think about that situation, and I think what he was describing for me was his experience of living in the flow of the gospel. And even how that experience was simply different than other approaches to life. And I realize you may say, well, George, that's a great story, but, you know, I can't write a big check. I can't, you know, I can't do things like that guy did. And I hear that. But let me also remi remind you, the, the example that the Apostle Paul gives is not of someone like that. The example he gives are these people in Macedonia who didn't have a lot of resources, but in their own way had discovered what it was like to live in the flow of God's grace. To allow God's grace to work in us so we're kind of making room for this generosity that is, is, is the outworking of God's grace and just to be open to what that might look like in our lives and open to what that means when it comes to handling our money. 
That's the invitation embedded in Jesus' provocative statement. It's more blessed to give than to receive. I realize at this point you may say, okay, I'm going to miss the next five weeks. I don't need to hear that. I get that. You may be thinking that. But let me tell you why I think this is important. And again, this time let's go back to the words of Jesus. We've alluded to the Sermon on the Mount, and interestingly, part of the Sermon on the Mount really addresses how we deal with our finances. And I think Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount answers the question, why is this important? When we come to Matthew 6 in a series of statements that deal with money and resources, you'll recall Jesus has that famous statement where he contrasts, you know, laying up, storing up for yourselves treasures in heaven versus treasures on earth. And he continues kind of with the theme of money, I think, in the next section, because here's what we read in the next section. The eye is the lamp of the body. If your eyes are healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eyes are unhealthy, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light within you is darkness, how great is that darkness? Now, what's fascinating here are the, the terms that Jesus uses. You'll notice right after the word healthy, I put in brackets the word generous. It turns out that the word used here for healthy is part of the same word group that Paul uses in 2 Corinthians 8 when he talks about the generosity of the church in Macedonia. And scholars recognize that it, it, the idea of healthy is, is kind of a part of that term, but it's, it's being healthy in terms of your generosity. Consequently, it, it, this isn't simply a contrast between being healthy and unhealthy. It's a contrast between being generous and stingy. And I think that contrast flows throughout this part of the Sermon on the Mount. And remember, the entire sermon is about life and this new reality that Jesus calls the kingdom of God. So the assumption when Jesus is talking about being healthy, being generous, is this is what it looks like to be rooted in grace. When he talks about the eye here, I think he's talking about your outlook, your approach to life the way you engage the decisions and situations in front of you. And in essence, he's saying this, when your outlook is healthy, it will be generous. And he associates it with light, right? And clarity and direction. It's an image of flourishing. But if your outlook is unhealthy, it's stingy. It's self-absorbed. And that's associated with darkness. Again, when I read this, there's, there's, there's kind of a long-term memory that is locked in my mind that I always go back to. It's a season, kind of an unusual kind of four weeks in my life where I, I was involved with two very different funerals in a short period of time. The first was a funeral of, of the mother of a longtime friend. Her elderly mother died, I think, at, at the time her mother died in her 90s, and I just wanted to go and support our, my friend, so I attended this funeral. Now, in so many ways, this, this woman had lived what you might call a pretty modest life. She was African-American. She had grown up in the Jim Crow South, and to some extent, that had limited opportunities for her. And yet, I went to kind of this small church, and it was... <laughs> It was just packed with people. And we got to a time in the service where there was an opportunity for sharing. And I learned so much about my friend's mom. Because it turned out, you know, she, she had kind of simple resources, never had a lot of money. But she was just always giving of herself in so many ways in the lives of people in her church and in the lives of people in her community. And one by one, we heard stories. I still remember there were a couple of really large guys who got up, and they had, they had had her as a Sunday school teacher when, she, when they were in elementary school. And they just, you know, they, she was kind of a character, and they told those stories, and, you know, you didn't mess with her, and you kind of got those stories. And there were other people, part of the church, even part of the community, that just talked about how she had been giving in so many different ways. 
And th this story was just kind of a celebration of life. And it, even just the impact that this very simple life had had on all sorts of people in all sorts of situations. A couple of weeks later, I was in a conversation with a mentor. And he had reached out for me, to me for this reason. Um, a few days earlier, he had been in a hospital room with a very successful businessman who was about to die. And by God's grace, this man made a commitment to Christ on his deathbed. And now my mentor would be conducting the funeral. And he said, George, I need, if you don't mind, he said, I need you to, I need you to house sit their home during the funeral. So I agreed to do that, and he, he gave me the address, and I'm kind of like, ooh, that's a nice neighborhood in Dallas. In fact, it was such, an, <laughs> such a nice neighborhood. I, I, I felt like I needed to wear a suit. So upon the day, a little before the time the family would be leaving the home, I showed up. I introduced myself. It was just this beautiful home. We, we had some conversation kind of in the foyer of the home, and there were just a couple of family members there. Then the limo pulled up to take them to the funeral. And now I'm all alone in this really big house. Okay, so maybe I looked around just a little bit, okay? <laughs> right, just a little bit. I didn't open anything, but I did kind of just wander around the first floor, the living room, and just all the... I think I brought a book to read, so I ended up reading the book, but... But in wandering around just a little bit, here's what I noticed. I, I didn't see any family pictures. I didn't, you know, I didn't see any picture, you know, vacation stuff or things they'd done together. I didn't see any of that. The artwork was beautiful. I mean, the house was pristine. It looked like it was ready for a magazine shoot. Not only that, when I kind of peeked into the kitchen, I didn't see any food. I didn't see any sign that other people had dropped by and, that, you know, they were leaving things, flowers, casseroles, cakes. You know, sometimes I've been in situations where it's like the home is just over, overwhelmed with food from friends and other people in the church. I didn't see any of that. All I saw was this magnificent home that was absolutely empty and absolutely sterile. And I still remember kind of in the quietness of this moment, <laughs> seated in this beautiful home, just kind of, you know, kind of, oh, wow, what's it like to live here? And the thought that came to mind, and I, and I really, I feel like this was really God's prompting in my heart. The thought that came to mind was this. George, compare these two situations and tell me which one is really flourishing? Which one is really life? Which one do you want to be the story that's told when you're dead and gone? Now I celebrate the fact that this guy made a commitment to Christ before he died, but it's like that's not that's not the healthy, generous life that Jesus envisioned. Now, over the next few weeks, we're, we're going we're gonna to talk more practically about, you know, well, what does this mean? What does it look like in terms? We're going to talk about giving. We're going to talk about saving. We're going to talk about lifestyle, try to really unpack all uh, that the Bible has to say in, at a practical level about what this means. But for now, as we get started, I just want you to hear the invitation. I want you to hear in Jesus' words an invitation directed towards you. When Jesus says it's more blessed to give than to receive, he is saying, I want you to be rooted in my grace and allow my grace to produce generosity in you so that you truly live out the generous life. That's his invitation. How will you respond? Let's pray together.
Gracious God, as I said, we, we, we hear the familiar words of Jesus in Acts 20 and frankly it can generate all sorts of questions and sometimes we're so familiar with it we just kind of gloss over it and don't even hear it anymore. And yet, rooted in that simple statement is an invitation to a radical way to live. And I pray over the next few weeks we're just going to kind of come to understand what that invitation looks like and be willing to embrace it. But I also pray foundational to that, Father, would be the realization that this is all about living in the reality of your grace. And so with that in mind, I just thank you for the work of Jesus Christ, the work that we've just celebrated. I thank you for the transforming work of your grace and the ongoing ways in which your grace can change us, can liberate us, can transform us. So as we talk about these things over the next few weeks, Father, I just pray we'd be open to your grace being at work in us and through us. And I pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. So thank you for being a part of our services this morning as we launch this new series. At this time, I'm going to invite members of our prayer team to be available here at the front. And if there are ways we can pray with you or things going on in your life where you would say, I would love for our church family to be in prayer for this. We would love to have that opportunity. So now as you go, will you hear Jesus' invitation clearly? an invitation to live in the reality of his grace. And it's a grace that truly produces generosity. Amen.